Come on, Soda Pop, let's go. Okay, our next item is going to be a discussion on the boulevard and, and parking strip. And uh, let me kind of lay out the, the process that we're going to use here because we'd like to have the opportunity for as much public input as we can possibly uh, squeeze in. And we, uh, looking at the clock, we have just a little over 60 minutes uh, because we do need to conclude land use uh, committee meeting by 6.45, so they have 15 minutes to do the changeover. And, um, and we also do want to allow a little bit of time for open discussion if we have, have any at that point. So I'm going to make some, uh, and I had a chance to talk with Councilors Jamison and Anderson and Councilor Staggers, I apologize because I did not have the opportunity to talk to you about the format that we're using. But I'm going to make just a brief opening statement, and then we're going to open it up to uh, public input. And you'll state, you'll come forward and state your name uh, for the record. And if uh, Denise needs assistance with spelling of your name, she will ask. Um, and we are initially going to put a five-minute maximum on, on speaking so that we give everybody an uh, opportunity to speak. And, um, and when you do speak, please uh, present uh, new information or, or make comments that haven't previously been uh, discussed or presented. And then once everyone has had, everyone from the public has had an opportunity uh, to speak, uh, I will invite city staff to add their thoughts uh, and maybe uh, respond to any, any questions that might have been asked uh, earlier. And then following the staff, the city council will weigh in and have a discussion um, among the, the committee members anyway. We'll have a discussion. And if we still have uh, time, if, uh, if time permits, uh, we do have that option of opening it up again to the, to the public following that, because I want to have as much input as we possibly can have. I do realize that for staff and committee members that that cuts into our ability to grab a bite to eat before the next meeting, but uh, I know that I've squirreled enough away where I think I can make it through. So anyway, um, let me just state this before we get started here. Uh, it's our intention and desire to be more flexible with what can be planted and or placed in the right of way. It is our hope we can encourage uh, conservation practices which will create vibrant and appealing streetscapes. We wish to explore options in addition to grass and trees that are currently allowed, while at the same time maintaining the functionality of the right-of-way without having an adverse effect on public safety or hindering access to public and private utilities. So, what are some of the possibilities? Allowable plants in the parking strip could include, but are not limited to these, uh, turf or natural grasses, annual, biennial, or perennial plants, including cultivated flowers and wildflowers, or even fruits and vegetables. Selected plants could be of a hardy nature and more resistant to the de-icing chemicals used in the winter months. In other words, we are open to more than just grass and trees in the parking strip. With that said, we do need to keep safety in mind. In order to promote safety and allow for safe visual sight lines for pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists, uh, a maximum height requirement for all plantings in the parking strip is something we need to take a look at throughout this process. So once again, our intent is to provide property owners more options without sacrificing safety, right-of-way functionality, or hindering public and private utilities. So let's get started. Once again, ground rules, state your name for the record, uh, and uh, a five-minute maximum, or less, please. Um, and as we continue, present new um, information or make comments that haven't been made previously. Welcome. Bruce Daniels from Sioux Falls. Uh, Jim is going to help me out here a little bit. I had uh, was thinking about this and talking with some other people, and and uh, I just kind of put together seven little pieces of the of this puzzle, and and I've got a couple things that I'll point to Jim when it's time. But uh, I agree, we need to revoke the the 
the grass only in the boulevard ordinance. It's, it's dated, it's, it's wrong for the environment, it's, it, it doesn't work with the de-icing, everything you've talked about, Mr. Kiley, I think it's important. Uh, I also agree that, that uh, allowing the flowers and the plants and shrubs and the brick mailboxes, you know, some of the brick mailboxes are getting huge, we've gotten a lot of issues involved with, with the, some of the rocks that are being put in. But, you know, the rocks are easy to move, a forklift, if I, I, some of the pictures that we recently saw, you know, it looks like a forklift's going to have to come in and move them. Well, maybe they had a car go through the yard one day. We just had that in the paper the other day where another car went into a house. Maybe that was their stop on it. Who knows? But uh, all of that stuff is movable. Um, so, but I, I do remember back in the day with uh, when the big discussion was about 20 years ago about the pebbles, the little pea rock that people were putting out in their <clears throat> boulevards, and it was washing into the, into the storm sewer system. So when we were on, Teresa and I went around and we looked at quite a few landscaping techniques and we saw where people actually dug down into their boulevard and made an area where the mulch and the rocks that they put in there stayed in there because they were below the height of the sidewalk and the, you know, they leveled off the sidewalk to the curb with other ground cover that was permeable. So, and when you talk about a maximum height on, on vegetation, you know, if you've got a hosta, a hosta may get, you know, 36, 40 inches tall, but it's just a flower that sticks up that high. It's not a big uh, miscanthus six foot grass that's growing up or somebody planting a sweet corn in their, in their boulevard. So it, I had a, a, a piece in here that, uh, well, that on the, well, anyway, we have the, thir the third it one was it needs to be, if you're gonna make, allow people to come in and do this additional work, uh, it's up to the homeowner or the landowner to replant it, take it out of there, put it back in, and that shouldn't have anything to do with, because the landowner is actually, or the person that planted it in the first place is gonna have the skill to move it properly and pre preserve it, and if it's an emergency, they can come in and wipe it out, big deal. It's sorry, but it's gotta go. Uh, and I've noticed in the work that I've had, the utility companies come and do at my house, they've been more than willing to go with every bit of my landscaping that I've got. The uh, fire hydrant issue, uh, I know in the winter time, talking to Chief Sedaris a couple of years ago about an issue, wanted to have 36 inches around the, the fire hydrant. And, for, and that was for snow removal. If there's something that happens you know, no planting of shrubs or fences or anything else, right, to interfere with any of that in the summertime or in the wintertime. Uh, when I had a, there's a drawing that I did, uh, uh, go with the one with the cars. Uh, we'll wait with that one. Yeah, that one. I did a little, little drawing here. Uh, several years ago, about 20 years ago, I was, uh, had an issue and John Smith from the street department and Pete Nikolai came out and and discussed it with me. And they came to look at my yard. Now, my front yard actually drops down quite a bit from the crown of the road. And so what would be 36 inches up from, from my sunken front yard is actually about 60 inches on a flat level plane when they said what they looked at was 36 inches from the crown of the road. And that puts, every, that puts all the neighbors on the same level plane. Even though my yard is lower than everybody else's, I could have a taller planting bed in my front yard, and I could do things in my boulevard that didn't interfere. And so based on their rule, they were looking at, and that's what I did with the drawing here that I made, was looking at the level of somebody driving by in a car, and the height of a, of a car was about 36 <clears throat> inches. And so that's what they were looking at. But from the crown of the road and not from the yard or the curb or anything else because it's all different all over town and this makes it at least some kind of consistency. And then I had a, uh, another point I wanted to bring up as long as we we're talking about the boulevards and having been at the joint Sioux Falls Brandon meeting a few weeks ago and I recorded and put it up online, 
And I really appreciated what the Brandon uh, City Council was talking about with trees and the damage that these large trees are causing in the boulevards. Now, this is probably going to get me in trouble with a lot of people, but I'm going to say it anyway. I really appreciated what they had to say. And you can go out and look at the video online and, and understand their thought process in it. I tried to find their ordinances, but I couldn't find it. But what they actually were doing was encouraging people to plant trees to canopy the boulevard and so on on their side of the sidewalk, in other words, on their property, so that way it'll canopy for many, many years to come without damaging the sewer systems, the electrical, when the gas company comes to put in new lines and they're using the thumper to go down and torpedo through the ground to get through, they aren't fighting all the, the roots and so on. So it's something to consider in the process. And then the, the last thing was another point that they brought up in there, and this goes back to Project Trim, with having the city of Sioux Falls actually hire certified arborists such as they do. And these teams would fan out through the community. They took and broke down Brandon in, yeah, I believe, in a three-year cycle where they were able to go through and they could trim the trees that the city already has in the, the boulevards that are the city's property. And I know that in several uh, areas of town, the city actually required the developer to put trees in the boulevard. And now the homeowners are having to fight trees they didn't even want in the first place. And so that's what I wanted to ask about and thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, we're a little bit over time on, on that presentation, but thank you for your uh, document and, and for the graphics as well. Anybody else would like to address <clears throat> the committee? Hi. Liz Meilenberg is my name. I lived in Sioux Falls for 41 years. Um, this was pre-written, so. Regarding the issue of plantings and landscapings in the boulevards of Sioux Falls, I think the city has far more important issues on which to focus. The assumption is that the visibility is the major and the only issue. If taste or aesthetics, aesthetics or style favorability are part of the issue, that is government overreach in my opinion. So I will proceed with the idea that visibility is the only issue with the written understanding, and I mean written into the ordinance, that the city itself will not violate the legislation it creates or offer waivers to itself or favored citizens. Regarding the visibility issue, the city has far more serious offenses and offenders than the simple homeowner who may have a few daylilies or grasses or even small boulders in their uh, boulevard. Foremost, to remember there have been no accidents resulting from citizen boulevard landscaping or planting. Zero, absolutely none. Let's consider the city's traffic signal boxes placed frequently and throughout our town. Liz, Here, could I get you to adjust the mics down just a little bit more? Thank you very much. Here is a photo of a moderate-sized box with an adult standing in front of a box placed in the boulevard. I'm thinking, Two adults could easily hide behind it and not be seen. Some of these street light control boxes are even placed on two or more of those huge cement cubes, raising it higher. Then there are the very many and various utility boxes and poles seen and placed everywhere in our boulevards. These present num are numerous and varied visibility issues most certainly are not very aesthetically pleasing. And do not forget all the postal drop boxes or the city's randomly placed garbage containers or cement planters placed around town. One could even argue that the downtown sculptures are a visi visibility issue. Certainly the center boulevard immediately south of the library displays pleasing artful sculptures, but is a visibility issue. But an even bigger and far more serious visibility issue is simply street parking as you see in the second page of photos. So I would like to conclude that you as counselors sitting here are personally charged to fairly represent the individual citizen as their personal representative in a city government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The individual citizens boulevard landscaping and grasses or daylily planting issues 
are small to non-existent in comparison to the many and various government infractions. I suggest that the city government remove the log from its own eye and serve as an example rather than a focus on a minute speck in the citizen's eye. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Hi there. Welcome. Mary Ellen Conley, also a longtime resident of Sioux Falls. And I'm here tonight to represent the Friends of the Big Sioux River and also Sioux Falls Beautiful. I did send a letter out to most of you, a long six-page document pulling together my ideas about soil and how um, the right-of-way is an opportunity for you guys to do a comprehensive right-of-way ordinance that would include permeable soil in the right-of-way. And um, so the right-of-way could become a three-pronged best management practice with this improved soil. So you could restore a mini riparian area. Each, each, each right-of-way would become a little mini riparian area with 24 inches of topsoil over permeable subsoil. And by that way, you get this first flush of stormwater would absorb into that riparian area. You would mitigate stormwater. You would mitigate pollution, non-point source pollution to the Big Sioux River. And you would also increase the viability, diversity, and longevity of trees and all other plants. So that's main. I, I also concur with the idea of growing non-turf plants, but that's already been spoken to, so I won't need to go there. So that was the main thing I wanted to address, the health of the river the stormwater mitigation, and the diversity and longevity of our trees. Mary Ellen, thank you very You're much. Welcome. I have extra copies of the document that I emailed you, if you would like. Yes. Shall Jim, can, Jim can pass those out for us. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address the committee? Greg Neinser, Sioux Falls. I'm just here as a private citizen who's been uh, interested in this for a while. Um, I don't have a vested interest. I actually only have, I'm in a new development, so I only have turf grass, but that's living on a local. It, we don't have a lot of problems with it. Um, did live on a uh, emergency snow route, and that was a much different animal. Um, so I'll try not to cover things other people have already covered, but I, I guess the first thing I would say is, and I know you'll do this. Let's start with the spirit of serving our citizens and honoring the pride they take in beautifying their boulevard. Let's not overcomplicate this. Whatever you do, I expect that you will expect it will be enforced. So the more stringent you make it, the more people you're going to put into noncompliance. And that's a very nice way of saying that you're going to have people who are going to have enforcement action taken on them and with that comes civil fines and penalties and essentially making them criminals and we got to be very careful about doing that there's really only two issues i think that come up and that's public safety and utilities so for utilities i as I've said before, I think we just need to ask Public Works and the private utilities what doesn't work. So I'm thinking they're going to say permanent installations of concrete and asphalt are not going to work. Uh, I'm not sure much else won't work. There might be some very things like pea gravel, things like that, that are, are going to be so small they're going to wash into the storm sewer. But let's ask the people that, that deal with it and uh, need to know. Um, I'd say let's not focus on what is allowed and get into the minutia of, you know, flowers are allowed and Russian sage is allowed, but Carl Forrester isn't. And let's just talk about what isn't allowed and make that a very small list. Let's let people be creative within reason. So as far as public safety, I, I think essentially we're talking about height. That's 
and, and then there's fire hydrants too, but really height. And I, I think we can come up with a reasonable number. I mean, I've heard three feet thrown out. It should be something reasonable when you think about all of the other things that are in the boulevard. Um, and then as Bruce had measured, measuring from a uniform position, such as the crown of the street, uh, remembering that we also have trees, mailboxes, and other things in the right of way right now. Um, and maybe the big thing to focus on is um, this isn't a new problem, if you want to call it a problem. We have hundreds of properties that are not in compliance right now, and I'm not aware of any accidents or problems already. So we have to be careful about, I guess I would maybe say, solving a problem that doesn't exist. Now, I totally agree. We shouldn't have something on the books that we're not enforcing. That needs to be addressed. But I, I guess I'm just saying let's be careful not to go overboard on the public safety issue. And I guess finally I would say when I look at what the city is doing downtown, which is beautiful, and then when I look at the reconstructions of arterials, and I've had discussions with public works and engineering about what they're, what they're thinking about when they do this. When I look at stretches of Russell down by the arena, and then I look close to me at 41st Street going from Sertoma to Tielis Road, I see beautiful, beautiful work in the medians, as an example. And you see lots of mixtures of, of perennials and all these things that we're talking about. And then you see the splash blocks, which helps with um, uh, protecting the grasses and the other living ground cover from all the salts. And so there's a lot of diversity that they're using in the medians. And so, you know, we could do a lot the same with the boulevard. So I guess what I'm getting at is um, let's honor what people are doing. They take a lot of pride in what they're doing. And let's just make it a short list. Let's not overcomplicate it. And let's keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Good afternoon. Hi, Teresa Staley. Say so you need to turn up the heat in here. <laughs> Little nippy. Anyway, um, and Jim uh, has some photos here. Um, I wanted to say I was appreciative of the comments that were made in the Argus Leader report yesterday. And I have personally driven past hundreds of properties, many of them in the southeast, southwest part of town, central part of town, where people are landscaping next to the driveway with mailboxes and daylilies and all sorts of things. I know they, they've hired people to do this. And at the end of the day, whatever we come up with, is it will be enforced, and when when these people are getting given notices, they have to rip things out. I, they will not be happy. So that's why I've been trying to get the message out, and I know some people haven't been happy with me for saying that these are the this is the worst case scenario. But I've watched stranger things evolve out of council action, and after you, you're done voting on this, it's too late. So we've got to get the word out to people ahead of time. I want to talk about safety. I've lived at my property at 24th and Van Epps for 23 years. And long before I had any flowers there, there was a fire hydrant in the boulevard. And we had a, an intersection that had near misses happening quite frequently. And I called the police department, I said, we, or the street department, we need a stop sign here. Oh, Teresa, you have to have three accidents before we'll put a stop sign in. I'm like, wow. So I continued to watch these near misses and people speeding through. And finally, one day, one of my neighbors comes up from he's heading south, and he gets rammed into by someone heading to the west. And I immediately called the street department. I said, now will you get right out here and you see what's happened. We need a stop sign. Remember, there were no flowers, nothing in the boulevard except a fire hydrant. Safety is people weren't paying attention. So guess what happened? They put up a nice red stop sign. Now I've started growing flowers, and I've said this before, my inspiration for doing my flowers was the McKinnon Park Boulevard. Beautiful Russian sage, daylilies, it's floating over the curbs, it's gorgeous. So I started doing that myself. I haven't had one accident on my property since I've been doing that. And I believe I, the question has been asked of Councilman Jamison, how many people have been injured 
maimed or killed because people have landscaping in their boulevard. I know we're very concerned about safety, and I, I'm going to take this to a different level. We, we can't even talk about a cell phone ban. We can't spend any energy on that, but we're spending a lot of energy talking about landscaping. Yeah, it, to me, it seems a little off. Anyway, I wanted to talk about the city being a leader here. We talked about the McKendon Park Boulevard, and I have some p beautiful pho photographs of pictures I took this fall downtown. Now, here we have the library area. You see me pointing there to the landscaping in the middle, middle of the street. We've got a big uh, thing there. Well, I, I don't know what you call that big thing, but it's, it's big. And uh, that's in one area. Next picture, please. Daylilies, they are arching over the side of the street there, quite large, you see. Okay, next picture, and another area where it's jutting out. We've got fencing out there. We've got pavers. Next picture. And last but not least are those beautiful grasses. So I say, hey, city of Sioux Falls, you're a leader. You lead us when it comes to speeding. Our city employees, we tell, the city tells us, do not speed. Enforce the speed limit. We don't speed. The city says, well, we're going to take care of our sidewalks. When it snows, you take care of yours. Bravo. The city says, don't have weeds. We're not going to have weeds in our property. Homeowners, don't have them in your own. We, we take your lead. Same thing about flowers. They're leading with this. We think it's beautiful. People downtown, I think, love it. So I'm with Greg. I say, let's not fix a problem that isn't there um, and keep it simple. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to make a comment? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to uh, ask uh, our city staff to add thoughts that they have on this topic, and I see we have uh, we have the three M's and, and one S out there. We've got Mark, Mike, Matt, and Shannon. Uh, any, who wants to go first? Any comments that you would like to make? Mark or Mike? Thank you, Councilor Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works and Council Members of Land Use. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's refreshing to get uh, good input uh, we've been receiving a lot of input at City Hall uh, to help us really, you know, as we look forward and start to establish guidelines. Uh, so we, so we do update um, as as Greg had mentioned. We've got an outdated ordinance uh, that today is very restrictive, and that recognizing that uh, not only on uh, city property but also on private property to really open that up and and establish some guidelines that as people call to ask what can we put in our uh, in our parking strip so that we can actually pull it out something thoughtful that um, is current and relevant for uh, today and so just a, a couple of points that as as uh, Councillor Kylie you'd mentioned points and that I'd heard from uh, some of the um, uh, community input. You know, the guidelines, as we see, they should promote uh, vegetation. It is a harsh environment with having five to six months of winter. Um, you know, that's one of the most restrictive pieces today is really it's a turf grass uh, ordinance. And so uh, really establishing what vegetation, some hardscape design flexibility, uh, promote community health, as Mary mentioned, not only for um, uh, the environment for the Big Sur River, uh, encourage conservation practice. You know, we have a sustainability arm, and this is just another opportunity for us to promote conservation practice and do more streetscapes uh, that we, when we do expand 41st Street. And um, there is a different purpose for a median as opposed to a parking strip um, when we are uh, moving traffic and, and creating a safe environment, but to have really standards that speak to both. Uh, vegetation um, today, as we talked about, is really turf and native grasses, but can certainly be more opened up to uh, annuals, biennials, uh, perennial plants, including flowers. Uh, we've gotten feedback on fruits and vegetables, and so we've been uh, taking some of that feedback. 
Safety is a very important part. You know, the, the way that the public receives its public, in, public utilities and its private utilities, many of the boxes that were shown, um, you know, there's as many uh, private utilities to serve uh, these neighborhoods as there is public utilities. And so to keep that conduit, if you will, to make sure that the neighborhoods get their power, get their communication, get their water, wastewater, storm sewer, that's essentially all located in the public's right of way and we want to make sure that we uh, preserve that functionality. Uh, safety is important. We talk a lot more about complete streets, and it's not just vehicles. It is pedestrians. It's bicyclists. <coughs> and when we look at safety, we've got uh, clear standards that whether it's an intersection, an alley, or a driveway, that there are uh, there's industry-specific uh, triangles to make sure that you can have some good, clear sight distances uh, and make those movements uh, safely. Uh, maintenance, we've, we've heard feedback on maintenance. Uh, we are constantly uh, in that public's right of way making improvements uh, throughout the city. Um, whether it's public or private, the gas company in the last uh, five years has put a lot of new uh, mains in throughout the city. And they've had to be in that, in that boulevard, so they will certainly appreciate being a part of the conversation, um, but also um, understanding the importance of what is expected uh, if they do disturb that area uh, from a restoration standpoint. And then last transition. Um, anytime you update an ordinance, uh, we have to have a thoughtful transition plan. And so those are uh, more feedback that uh, we'll be soliciting <coughs> as we go through this. And so I appreciate the ability to share some comments, uh, Councillor, and I'll let Mike weigh in. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services. Um, in taking my notes from our five presenters today, we have been looking at this for quite some time at the staff level, as, as people know. And the things that we're trying to key in on that we've heard today is Let's start out by talking about what is the function or the purpose of having this right of way between the sidewalk and the curb. Why do we have that? Uh, is it for utilities? Is it for aesthetics? Is it to promote uh, a clear area between parking and the sidewalk? So we want to kind of start out with that as we go forward and zero in on the real functionality of the right of way, the parking strip or the boulevard. And then we have to decide what we're going to call this area too, but we'll get there. Uh, we want to we want to continue to talk about <coughs> vegetation and non-vegetation that's going to be allowed or that's not going to be allowed. And I think that's going to be fairly easy to come up with. Uh, and maybe we take the approach of just saying what's not allowed. That might be a shorter list. Uh, the non-vegetation one is that we've, one that we've talked a lot about, uh, non-living ground cover, the rock, landscaping, those kind of things. How do we define that? How do we describe what would be allowed or not allowed. The enforcement action, again, I think that's gonna be important as we move forward because whatever we end up with, there are gonna be people that are still gonna be out of compliance. So how do we deal with those in terms of moving that forward? And then how do we communicate between now and the end with the public as far as what we're working on, what we're thinking on? Because I think the Land Use Committee is gonna talk about today that there'll be more public forums after today. And uh, I think Mark and I and our other team back here would even be willing to bring forward a draft of some something that's maybe not in an ordinance format, but at least would have some talking points that could be converted into an ordinance based on what we've heard today. But we have a number of existing ordinances on the books. Uh, we have the fire hydrant clear area. We have tree planting guidelines. We have a specific requirement that in the downtown area that that's exempt from um, the intersection and driveway safety zones where there are signalized intersections. Um, within our zoning ordinance, we have requirements for the front yard, the required front yard, what kind of landscaping is needed there. And then as Mark mentioned, we have the intersection and driveway safety zones, and now we're talking about an alley safety zone. So as we've heard today, what the public is thinking about and is what we've been already researching, I think we're, all, we're very comfortable 
bringing something forward to the land use committee that, that you can use to continue this discussion. Okay, thank you, Mike. Any other city staff comments? And Kurt, I didn't mean to uh, let you, leave you out there. I mean, we do want to hear from you if you have anything to say. Not he he hearing nothing from Kurt, we'll move on to committee now. Uh, committee comments? Thoughts? Councilor Jameson. Thank you. Uh, I think all of us have probably received some phone calls or emails regarding this topic as well. And to get them into the record and to share with you some of those uh, that maybe were partially mentioned, but maybe not fully. Uh, individuals who live on arterial roads who have the grass that's killed by the chemicals from the plow, they should be allowed to put splash blocks uh, just like the city does in their uh, medians so they can avoid all that maintenance. Um, notice of work getting done on the boulevard should be uh, given to the homeowners, which apparently it is a common practice, but it should be required so that the homeowner has an opportunity to move those flowers if they so choose. Recommendation of 36 height, inches as a, as a height of living matter be referred. Um, another one was uh, implementation of this program. The consideration was that uh, if you were to allow three years to lapse, would allow the individual homeowners uh, all across the city to uh, become in compliance, be in, in com comply with the ordinance, whatever that might be, to give them time to do this work and uh, change it. They may have flowers that are ready to bloom in the coming season and to tear them out uh, could be a problem, but they may have other opportunities. Anyway, a transition period of some sort. Uh, the enforcement part, uh, nobody's gonna like it, uh, but it should start with some education and uh, there's some individuals who are willing to uh, contribute to the development of a video, education video of uh, you know, demonstrating what should be acceptable and uh, what's, what works and what doesn't, ideas, uh, thoughts about how to uh, make those boulevards beautiful. Uh, even a rebate program was suggested for um, property owners who were using a tremendous amount of water, watering their yard, now made changes in their boulevards and uh, reduced their bill. Some kind of a rebate program, just like we had done with uh, toilets and dishwashers or washer machines and other things to encourage water conservation. Um, individuals and neighbors, uh, individuals who are elderly or disabled, who are unable to maintain a yard, should they be given cons other considerations of what they uh, can and can't do? Um, that really wraps up most everything I have, but it does come down as well to the height. Uh, an interesting question, if I could, if I could, the uh, to staff uh, consider the idea of it was brought up about making a list of what's not allowed. And do we have any other ordinances that follow that model? I mean, that would be a, an interesting, <laughs> interesting approach because I think that might be a, might be a good idea. I just, I, I, I don't know that we have ordinances that are structured that way, but I'd be up for listening to that. Anyway, that kind of wraps up the, the comments that I've received and phone calls and emails and other personal uh, suggestions, so. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> Councilor Anderson. Uh, I've met with several people and discussed uh, over these boulevards also, and I agree with the comments of Councilman Jamison. Um, I think one of the other things, though, that we have to make sure that is known citywide is that these boulevards uh, belong to the city, and that if there is an emergency, we are going to go in there and deal with the emergency. We're going to remove whatever's in the way and and deal with that on scheduled maintenance i'm all for there should be a notice that would allow people to be able to remove uh, whatever they have whatever design plants things like that out of that boulevard um, and then once again we go back in there 
once we're done with our work, uh, we basically put the dirt back in, uh, in, a, in a nice way, and then the, the property owner would come back in and redo their own design. But other than that, uh, in the military, we used to call it KISS, keep it simple, stupid. And uh, I think in this case here, what we're talking about with the boulevards, it fits perfectly. And that, uh, you know, the, some of the concerns, I guess, that I, I heard uh, that, well, that came up to me were the only thing I really saw was like fruits and vegetables. I'm, I'm, the only thing I'm concerned about that is the maintenance of that, making sure those fruits and vegetables don't end up in our gutters and then in our storm sewers, things like that. But other than that, I think that uh, allowing our citizens to beautify their yards and the boulevards uh, should be a, is a great ideal and we should move forward with this. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Anderson. Councillor Staggers, any thoughts on this topic? Well, I, I guess my inclination is to always uh, to try to allow the citizens as much freedom as possible when it comes to uh, these kind of issues. Um, and so consequently, you know, I would be inclined to uh, say that uh, our uh, citizenry should be allowed to, you know, pretty much do what they want to with the boulevard um but also at the same time uh that they can do that then they're also responsible for you know maintaining the boulevard too um but uh, i i i think that's the best way to go about it um is to allow the citizenry as much freedom as possible uh in um, uh, developing the boulevard and and uh because after all, they, they live there. Mm -hmm. Day in and day out, they live uh, by the boulevard and uh, they're gonna try to present something that's really nice. They're not gonna have anything, you know, really crummy looking. Uh, for, they're gonna try to have a nice boulevard. Okay, thank you, Councilor. <coughs> Councilor Anderson. Uh, one other thing is, and since that did also come up, was the trees in the boulevard. <coughs> a few years ago, we did uh, West, I want to say 46th Street, and uh, I think Mark's already remembering where I'm going with this. The contractor that uh, we completely tore up the road, replaced it. Uh, Councilman Jamison and I got involved in a situation where the contractor uh, grinded the base of the trees that were in the boulevards, uh, effectively killing them, but left them in the boulevards. And uh, basically after some work we did get those trees taken out and replaced if you look at that street now most of those citizens put their trees on their side of the sidewalk instead of putting it into the boulevard and just as we had a minor discussion here a lot of the utilities in that that are in there and then your curb and gutter i i think you know the city uh, encourages people to plan in the boulevard I wish we would move away from that because I, I feel that the cost to our citizens when those trees mature are not realized when they first plant them. And I think this could be a, a part of this discussion also. Okay, thank you. Um, like Councillor Jamison, I had a couple of uh, comments or uh, people that had uh, emailed me and I had three phone calls, uh, one that did not request a return uh, call back, uh, two I did return the call and once I basically explained to them what we're trying to do here, they, they felt that it was a reasonable approach. Um, with, the, uh, with the emails, um, they, uh, just to give you a brief synopsis of, of some of them, uh, Whatever you set as a plan, it should be enforced. And I think we're all in agreement that that is the case. And it should be uh, the citizen-owned property as well as city property. It should be even across the board, uh, no exception. So once we do have something set, it needs to be enforced regardless who the property belongs to. Uh, this individual uh, also goes on to say there's no reason to have anything taller than 
12 inches in the boulevard. They did feel that pavers and small rocks should be okay because they did address the issues with uh, the chemicals in the wintertime. Um, this, uh, another individual indicated they're glad to see the city council updating rules on boulevard plannings because many people put a lot of effort in making their uh, boulevards look, look uh, beautiful. Um, any vegetation other than deciduous trees should be no taller than 18 inches. Uh, boulevards should not have bushes, hedges, or, or evergreens above 18 inches. Um, and then another individual, uh, since we allow grass to grow up to 18 inches before it has to be, it's required to be mowed, then anything should be allowed in the boulevard that is uh, up, to, up, up to 8 inches. So it, it kind of, a lot of what I had, uh, what was sent to me, echoes uh, what has been stated here, here today. And uh, just to, before I open it back up again for further comment, uh, my thought on the next step is that we would, would I'd like to keep this in uh, land use committee because it's uh, uh, a little easier to have public input in, in this forum than it is in others. So if we could, uh, if city could come back with some more thoughts and ideas, maybe more specifics in January, is that possible? And then we could uh, just flip things around a little bit. You could do your presentation and then we could take uh, uh, questions from the committee as it normally, we'll just follow the normal routine as well or, or the public and then questions from the committee. Okay, so anybody else, please step forward. I just have one short comment about the trees. I would suggest if you seriously consider that, that it would be for newly planted trees and not go through the center of town cutting down everything that's in the boulevard. No, it would not be <laughs> older, mature trees. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, Bruce. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that that was understood from the discussion that the Brandon people had had at that meeting. I thought it was a very good discussion. And actually, uh, Councilman Jamison started the conversation, and I thought it, it went in a really nice way they, because they were taking, as the trees died, or there was some kind of an emergency or something happened, then Brandon didn't put a new tree in that spot. They actually offered a new tree to the homeowner to put it in their side of the sidewalk. And I thought that was wonderful. Uh, a couple weeks ago I was here and I, and I showed this little piece about what code enforcement, this is actually from a uh, 2008 code enforcement uh, report audit that had been done by the audit, uh, internal auditor. And this is what happens, and this is why I went to court last year and, and succeeded in beating the, the charges against me with all of the issues is because there is no way a citizen can follow this. So by allowing somebody to, uh, to actually have a, a list of what's acceptable and be within reason on the acceptable, code enforcement could be that simple, you know, and we could actually have a code enforcement system that actually follows state law. As proven in, the, in my court case, the, states, uh, the city still is not following legal process on code enforcement. Something else we should talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, everybody. And uh, just another word in response to what Mike Cooper said. Uh, and we're, I'm hearing two different stories about this downtown area. He said that there, these flowers are allowed down there on the, the boulevards because you've got street lights going on. I've got a stop sign by my house. See, I don't think it's going to fly with the public if you say, well, we got some street lights, so we're going to put all these flowers along the street. We can do it. Do as we say, not as we do. Also, if you're talking about safety zones by driveways, there are big, huge, brown flower pots by driveways downtown. You've got all sorts of things plopped down there. So once again, 
this hasn't and again in your district mr kiley you've got lots of people with mailboxes there's things in that safety zone then so are we going to open up a can of worms that's going to put down the lash on people and say rip this out this is our safety zone you can't have anything within 30 feet or whatever you're going to say and i'm saying i will help to enforce this that the city I just don't think the citizens are going to go along with this. Let us remember that we are the city. We all pay taxes. This is not you against us. This belongs to all of us. You are elected now. We're all moving through in different roles that we play. But we're all in this together. So it shouldn't be bureaucrats over here, citizens over here. We make decisions. You do this. No, we're in this together. We all pay the taxes to pay the salaries. So we need to be doing things that are servicing the citizens and making this user friendly and embracing people instead of saying we're going to come up with rules and regulations and hoops that you will jump through. Amen. I better jump in here one more time. Mary too. Ellen. Um, so I didn't, I wanted to go back over this, um, I didn't go over this before, but to compare the differences in topsoil in, in the right-of-ways in three different cities, Sioux Falls, Aberdeen, and Brookings. <clears throat> in Sioux Falls, when it comes to the right-of-way topsoil depths, Sioux Falls is like two different cities. The mid-century and older neighborhoods often have many more inches of topsoil than post-70s neighborhoods do. Since the 70s, the new neighborhoods have been built outside the older core area of Sioux Falls. The valuable topsoil is scraped off and stockpiled. And unless prearranged, it is common that less than four inches of topsoil, approximately the thickness of a driveway, are replaced, compared to the average natural depth of topsoil of 10 to 20 inches. Currently in Sioux Falls, there is rare regard to significant topsoil replacement and permeable soil conditions in the right-of-way and elsewhere, even in upscale neighborhoods. So in Aberdeen, for the sake of health and tree diversity, Aaron Keats, the city forester, has, right, has jurisdiction over the right of ways. So the city forester um, has made this happen. So when he first took, play, took office about 10 years ago, he initiated a 24-inch topsoil requirement in the right of ways and planting islands. That was about 10 years ago. But since then, the road to, the right-of-way topsoil depth was reduced to 18 inches. Aaron said he didn't fight that. I guess, according to um, our city forester, uh, Dwayne Stahl, he said originally they tried to get three feet in their right-of-way in Aberdeen, settled for 24, and has since reduced to 18. But one of the things that the, the right-of-ways there absorb four to 18 times the stormwater of most Sioux Falls developments, which have less than four inches of topsoil. So the reason Aaron did this in Aberdeen was really for the prosperity of his trees. But as a result, they also mitigate the stormwater. And then, as I said before, it, it takes the first flush of that, uh, the fertilizer, the pesticides, the herbicides, and all those things that come off the lawn, it takes that first flush, creating that little mini riparian area. So back in, um, in, in Brookings, the city of Brookings requires 12 inches of permeable topsoil in the right of way. Again, a buffer to absorb stormwater and lawn chemicals. In Brookings, the topsoil soaks up three to 12 times the stormwater than the less than four inches of topsoil in Sioux Falls. Thad Dreetz, the city of Brookings assistant city engineer, said they originally tried to get 15 inches on the of topsoil, but settled for 12. He said the rows are so much healthier, you can see a huge difference between the right of ways, excuse me, I keep saying rows, right of ways compared to the rest of the lawns that they could not get the same 12 inches required. So I just wanted to give you a little update on what's happening in the right-of-way and all these advantages and, as, and how the right-of-ways are this opportunity to, to create this better environment for the plants, the stormwater, and the, okay. and the, and the river. Thank so, you very thanks. much, Mary Ellen. Okay, we'll wrap this up <coughs> with a uh, last chance for comments from the committee members. Councillor Jamison. Thank you. I would uh, urge us as well uh, when, the, when the staff is reviewing this, I think there is a fair uh, argument to be made about uh, should there be exceptions for downtown and or city-owned property. 
and I see that kind of as a certainly as a consideration. The other is the enforcement. Uh, no way around it. Obviously, this discussion came before, and we uh, we all kind of shunned away from it a little bit at the end because we were um, concerned about it, and the whole issue of maybe enforcement is a part of this that is going to uh, uh, become a challenge for us uh, when somebody's boulevard is tore out because they uh, didn't comply. So I would sense that we almost have to make our standards or suggested standards so high and, and so that it becomes crystal clear and obvious that the intent of a safe, sustainable, uh, beautiful boulevard is not achieved. So it's almost like crystal clear it, that it's violating the spirit of the ordinance versus uh, out there with a ruler or measuring stick or doing something uh, <coughs> only to cut off the top of a flower, you know what I mean, just to make them comply. So uh, I think a lot of consideration needs to be put into the enforcement uh, effort um, and not take that lightly because it will be... Uh, how all of the public uh, interfaces with this. So, and it's important that we do enforce the ordinances that we have on the books. And, and as well, if I could wrap it up, I would uh, I'd like to thank that uh, the recommendation by Councilor Kiley moving forward with uh, some revisions coming from the city, my ideas, and then another chance for the public to weigh in is a good approach and a nice, slow, steady approach. And that's what I was after from the beginning. I think that's a great idea. I support that, uh, and I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate their input. <laughs> Councilor Anderson. Uh, took the words right out of my mouth, Councilman Jamison. The first thing I wanted to do is thank all of you that uh, came through our weather today to uh, make these statements. It helps give us some direction to move forward. Um, Mark, Mike, uh, the something i'd like to hear something about a little more about is this topsoil ideal also because i seen some head shaking as uh the lady was giving her presentation on that and i'd like to know why we have the differences from other cities and that and how that would work but uh once again i think we're also on the right track thank you chair uh for keeping this in the land use I think it's it's a, a worthwhile discussion to have, and perfect season to do it before before we actually start seeing more growth out there. Uh, hopefully, we get a little more snow to cover everything up, but then uh, by spring, hopefully, we're in the right direction here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilor. Um, yeah, speaking of season, I, I pulled into my driveway yesterday, and it almost appears I'm going to have to go out and mow my yard. It's green and getting longer. So things are a little messed up right now, but our intent is to get this clarified uh, and knocked out so in time for the next growing season so that uh, our residents can plan accordingly. And one last thought that I had in terms of once we have the uh, set of policy, you know, education I think is always a great approach and maybe it's something that we as a city can work with the home builders and the landscapers, uh, as well as the nurseries, too, to help them make them aware of what the policy is so that they can be giving good advice uh, to the new homeowner or to the individual purchasing their product. Y'all come back now, dude.